Hello and welcome to our latest Global Fleet Champions webinar. If you're new to our webinars, Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Break the Road Safety Charity to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. Please visit our website globalfleetchampions.org to find out more. Today's webinar is sponsored by Litix and is entitled Safe Systems for Fleet Managers. Every road death and injury is a preventable tragedy and the best way to prevent them is by designing roads, vehicles and policies in such a way that human error can never lead to a road crash. This design philosophy, known as a safe systems approach to road safety, is available to us now and there are lots of ways that fleets can support and adopt safe systems. Whether it is safety technology in vehicles or speed limits that reflect the safety of the road, today's webinar will discuss the part you can play by championing, championing design-led solutions that enable people to move in safe and healthy ways. In a moment, a multiple choice question poll will appear on your screen so we can find out your views on this topic. It is anonymous, simply select one answer and press submit, and we will discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which is also your opportunity to ask some of today's presenters any questions you might have. You can put forward your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on the webinar panel. A big thank you to our sponsors, Litix, and to you all for viewing today's webinar. The poll question will appear on your screen shortly, and the webinar will then begin. Thank you. Let me introduce safe system approach in road traffic and, and the fundamentals of that approach. My name is Fred Wegman from Delft University of Technology and I prepared you a short presentation on this topic. I start with describing the traditional approach in road safety and I call that approach reactive and effective. Basically what we are doing is that we are going to our data and we try to identify what I call risk increasing factors. And then you come up with novice drivers, elderly road users, alcohol, distraction, driving hours or fatigue, violations. And then you make a picture like this one on the bottom side where you can see that uh, this is age against risk for males and females. And then you identify novice drivers, young drivers as having a high risk and elderly drivers as well. And then you ask yourself, why do we have these high risks? And the next question is, can we reduce these high risks? And I call that that we treat spikes in distribution. And that's what we have done in the path in road safety. And we treated them and we try to, uh, to reduce these spikes. And as I said, these are effective, uh, is an effective way of, of working. And here I listed areas, hopefully familiar to you, areas where we are active and we try to improve the situation. Our road users, roads, vehicles, post crash. Um, and I, uh, I, um, I listed here uh, several examples. On the bottom side of the slide, you see the so called Pillar approach, five pillar approach, uh, launched by WHO, World Health Organization. And you can simply uh, list all these different uh, potential interventions. And as said, uh, this is an effective approach. And we made a lot of progress in many, many countries in the world. But in the meantime, we learned that um, still our road uh, traffic system is an inherently unsafe system. And uh, that, that comes from the fact that the system has not been designed with safety in mind, as is the case with other modes of transport, such as aviation and railways. And that makes us in road traffic almost fully dependent on how good the road users form their tasks. And we know that sometimes these people make errors or mistakes and the problem is that people are uh, doing that all the time 
um, and that we are making ourselves dependent on individuals and sometimes that goes wrong. And the second fundamental problem we have is that in crashes, the energy levels will, in a crash, will result in uh, injuries because these uh, forces or um, uh, these forces are too high to tolerate. And these are the two reasons why we can think about another approach. And we call that these days the safe system approach. Um, safe system approach, and we have different names in the world of that approach, and you see them here. Vision Zero coming from Sweden, towards zero from OECD, sustainable safety from my own country, the Netherlands. Uh, but I do believe that safe system covers best what we are talking about. And there are all these different approaches have the same principles. And it starts from the human being that they're making errors and that human body has limited physical ability. And secondly, there are there is a shared responsibility among the stakeholders, the designers and the operators of the system and the road users. And the other one is that all parts of the system should be strengthened in combination, not in isolation of each other, but in combination. These are the fundamentals. And if I talk about safe system, then I make a distinction between three levels, the vision, the principles, and the tools. The visions, how to, to uh, deal with road safety in society, a set of principles, and a set of tools. And these uh, visions, and the set of tools, they differ in different countries, but the set of principles are rather similar. And here you have the safe system principles. As said before, people are the measure of all things, physically and psychologically, the human capacities and the human limitations, and uh, talking about the road transport system as a system in an integrated way, that we try to integrate man, vehicle, and roads in the safe system. In this approach, we try to cover the whole road network, all vehicles, and all road users, not only a subset of them, align with other policy areas, and finally, to share the responsibilities between those who design and operate the system and the road users. And I listed here two main characteristics of this safe system approach. I call it an ethical approach because we don't want to hand over the traffic system to the next generation with current casualty levels, but considerably less. Towards zero, some people say zero, but towards zero is fair enough. And it is a proactive approach. That means that we are, there's no need to wait for crashes before to act. We, the road safety community, we have a lot of knowledge already to be applied, and there's no need to wait for applying that knowledge until a crash had occurred. And the only thing I can say on that is that we have to adapt the knowledge to the local conditions. We cannot simply say it's working in the US, so it will work in the UK or in the Netherlands. People are the measure of all things. Uh, I talked about that. The road system should be designed to expect and accommodate human error because it is inevitable that road users make mistakes and sometimes violate the law. And as a consequence, crashes occur. And the second element of that is in a crash, interaction between the vehicle, the roadway, and the human body must be managed so that serious injury likelihood is minimized, if not eliminated. And I call that the system approach, where you uh, accept errors and you expect them. And the framing of these errors is that they are more seen as a consequence rather than as a cause, having not so much their origins in the perversity of the human nature, but in upstream systemic factors. And the interventions, the countermeasures, are then based on the assumption that Though we cannot change the human condition, we can change the conditions under which humans work. That's also known as not fitting the person to the job, but the job 
to the person. James Reason, a behavioral scientist from the UK, um, put both approaches next to each other, the person approach and the system approach. And the person approach starts from individuals because they are forgetful, inattentive, moral weak, poor motivated, careless, reckless, and negligent and breaking the law. That is the perspective of that person approach. And uh, if you have that uh, perspective, then you can take measures. And the system approach is completely different. Try to avert errors uh, or to mitigate their effects by building in defenses, barriers, safeguards in the system. I talk about the risk factors, and here I have the basic risk factor, and that is a fact. Uh, these are factors that are involved in all crashes. And then we talk about speed, the mass, and the protection combined with the vulnerability of the human body. And there, the kinetic energy is the key element of that. And here you have uh, the simple form uh, formula of that, and, and you recognize it. And basically what you try to do is to um, deal with this kinetic energy and to bring it to a lower level than the level that reduce, that uh, results in injuries. And here I have an example uh, illustrating this point of safe speed. What I've, I've put here is a study coming from Australia. And on the x-axis you see the different uh, impact speeds. And on the y-axis, you see the probability of serious injury. And this is a cumulative curve, meaning for different crash types, uh, crash between a pedestrian, a car, and a head-on crash, and a rear-end crash, for example. And here you can see that what uh, the chance, the, the chance of being injured given the impact speed. And uh, have a look at the, the curve for pedestrians, and there you can see that if you have an impact speed of 20 kilometers per hour, there's a, a chance of being injured as a pedestrian of 10%. And you see these different curves and different impact speeds. And based on information like this, you, you can define what is a safe impact speed, and then you can find what is a safe operating speed, and then perhaps what is a safe speed limit. This whole approach, is not new uh, elsewhere. And here I have an example, a famous example of a vessel, uh, the health of free enterprise, perhaps you remember that, and it capsized uh, near the Belgium harbor. And initially there was a research, an inquiry carried out in the UK, and it was clear from that re research that uh, staff, the sailors, they have to be blamed for the crash because they forgot to close the door, the bow door. And later on, they did an in-depth investigation and they, they said, well, this is ridiculous to blame all those, only those people. Uh, you have to, to have a look at the whole system. And based on this, um, on, on this, this, this incident, uh, they did a study and they came up with all sorts of recommendations how to improve the design of the vessel, the harbor, how to deal with cargo and passenger management, the scheduling and the, uh, the vessel operations. So not just blaming the individuals for the for this event, but blaming the system. And based on this, there was a complete redesign of, of the vessel, for example. And, and an event like that cannot occur with modern vessels anymore. And here I have another example. Uh, this is a high-speed train derailment in the north of Spain, and also initially blaming uh, the engineer, the driver of the train, and later on they understand that the system in itself um, uh, was not safe at all, and they have to uh, prevent crashes like this um, by redesigning uh, the system. And that's what happened uh, in this case as well. And we are now moving in road traffic to this approach. So it's my view that this safe system thinking has the future. The traditional approach to improve road safety will become less effective and less efficient. Safe system thinking works from a theoretical perspective, 
on the human operator, on the human being. And coming from practices elsewhere, there's a lot of evidence from these other modes. They apply this approach in the industry and they apply this approach in the medical sector as well. There are, there are already uh, good examples in the world uh, applying this thinking in road traffic and I have here given one example from my own country, the Netherlands, where we reduced the number of fatalities in this period of time with 30% by implementing this. And of course, Safe System has to respond to new opportunities and then I'm talking about how are we incorporate uh, all the automation coming to us of automated vehicles and things like that. And this is the final slide I have for you. The safe system approach is a combination of a good understanding of causes of crashes and a vision to tackle the problems fundamentally. And I talked about this basically risk factors and not only about the risk inclusion factors. Safe system is a vision, a set of principles, and a set of tools. The safe system approach differs in different countries, Vision Zero in Sweden, the sustainable safety in the Netherlands, but the fundamentals of these different approaches are the same. Safe system design is context specific and requires input from all stakeholders. Context specific means that I expect that the design in my country will differ from the design in your country or the design in the US or the design in a low middle income country. And it requires input from all stakeholders, not just government or not all tiers of government, but also from the private sector. And if we talk about the private sector, uh, then um, the contribution should cover the full range of the so-called corporate value chain. So then I talk about every activity in a company for example, the inbound logistics, uh, the operations, the outbound logistics, uh, the marketing and sales, and also the services. So not uh, all the transfer uh, of, of a company. And in that respect, safe system thinking uh, can absolutely make a contribution to make private sector activities uh, safe following the safe system principles. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hello, um, my name's Andrew Morris. Uh, I'm Professor of Human Factors in Transport Safety at Loughborough University. Um, I've been involved in traffic safety research for, for over 30 years, and I've got extensive experience of collision investigation and data analysis. And my session today involves um, a discussion of the safe system of road transport, um, which is a concept which is gaining popularity within highly motorised countries. So we look to discover really how road casualties can be further reduced. Um, many road transport systems are not safe. Um, we may have very safe cars driven by very safe drivers, but on very poor designs of roads. And for a system to be 100% safe, we need all of the individual components of it to be by themselves 100% safe. So the safe system is really based on a number of principles. These are the key ones, really. That human beings make mistakes that can lead to crashes. Uh, that the human body has a limited physical ability to absorb kinetic energy that crashes exert before physical harm to the body occurs. That there is shared responsibility amongst those who build, manage and use the roads and the vehicles on them, and that all the parts of the system should be sufficiently strong to multiply their efforts, so that if one part of the system fails for any reason, then the road users are still protected. In today's session, we're going to focus more or less on the first two principles, bearing in mind that the last two should be adopted by those with a responsibility for ensuring safety at an organisational level. So the first principle um, regarding human performance is that people make mistakes because overall people are very dangerous. Most driving maneuvers that people make are correct or acceptable, but people inevitably make mistakes from time to time. In fact, about one in 500 driving decisions are wrong, uh, but fortunately many of these are such that the driver can deal with them as and when they need to, or the vehicle can take some sort of remedial action 
depending on the safety systems that the vehicle has. But very occasionally, errors do lead to crashes. And it's interesting to note that only about 30% of crashes are caused by deliberate or risky traffic behavior. So therefore, we're dealing with a situation where most crashes result from very simple everyday misjudgment errors that many of us are prone to. Even though most of the time we are quite compliant with the uh, road uh, with the road rules. Now there are several studies of human error. Um, many studies of human error as a factor in crashes, and all suggest, if you look at the data, that human error is responsible for around 80 to 90 percent of crashes of one form or another. As we as humans are fallible, the likelihood is that crashes will occur, whatever we do. But the penalty for making an error should never be death or serious injury. Therefore, in a safe system, um, we have a situation where um, the system understands that humans will occasionally make mistakes and the system will allow for this. And really, this is exactly what is suggested by this statement. In a nutshell, um, errors will always occur and the human being is capable of withstanding only so much force without death and serious injury occurring. Therefore, if we have a safe system, it needs to be able to manage our road infrastructure so that road users can make mistakes but never be exposed to crash energies beyond those that can be tolerated by the human body. The second principle of the safe system involves human tolerance to impact. And here is the problem, really. As a species, uh, Homo sapiens have evolved over millions of years from a long line of hominids to be hunter-gatherers and we're optimized for walking and occasionally running and our maximum design speed is something like 10 meters per second or 36 kilometers per hour obviously a little bit higher if you're Usain Bolt but current traffic systems and vehicle designs obviously allow travel speeds which are associated with energy that cannot easily be managed in the event of crashes so as well as being error tolerant, uh, so far as is reasonably practical, a safe system needs to be tolerant of our physical limitations so that crashes do not lead to death and serious injury. And the foundation for this is an understanding of what our tolerance levels are and designing our system around these limitations, either through controlling road speed or crash energy management from vehicles or road infrastructure. Some of our energy management is possible through vehicle design. So in a typical 64 kilometer per hour head on crash, there is an opportunity managed to manage the crash energy through good engineering design of the vehicle. In the example shown here, uh, through engineering structures built into the vehicle, the force experienced by the occupants is around about 18 G and the kinetic energy is around about 208 kilojoules. Now these values are tolerable by a human occupant, maybe not without some sort of uh, risk of injury, but the crash forces can be even more successfully managed effectively by implementation of good restraint systems, including airbags, so that um, the, the most you can expect is some sort of minor injury or bruising or abrasions, which is a small price to pay for, the, um, uh, for a successful um, um, outcome in any particular crash. So regulation has had a big effect on improving safety for particularly for car occupants. By the late 1990s there were significant improvements in vehicle design and eventually we had regulations which came into force for new passenger vehicle models in 1997 first of all and then all uh, models or all, all vehicle models were forced to comply with effect from 2003. And there are two sort of main regulations that have this overriding effect on, on vehicle design, one involving frontal impact and the second involving side impacts. This is the regulation involving frontal impacts, involving an impact to what's called a deformable block um, with 40% overlap. So 40% of the vehicle front engages with the, with the, um, the deformable block. Um, within the regulation, there's restriction on steering column movement and there are also dummies in the vehicle uh, which are used to assess um, the injury risk to vehicle occupants, and in particular predicting the risk of head, neck, chest, uh, upper and lower legs. 
Now, this is all very well for vehicle occupants, but it isn't so good for the vulnerable road users. And this is some analysis of, acts of collision data that we conducted a few years ago. And what we have done is to analyze what might happen for all road users if we continue at the current rate of progress. In other words, if we do nothing more in terms of road safety countermeasures, this is where, this is where we're likely to be by around about 2030. Clearly, the numbers of passenger car fatalities will reduce even further to just over 5,000 or so, whilst the vulnerable road user fatalities will decrease at a much lower level, such that the gap between the vulnerable road users and the vehicle occupants, if you look at the vulnerable road users collectively, would all but disappear. In fact, you could argue that the vulnerable road user fatalities might be slightly higher than the vehicle car occupants. So thanks to a raft of uh, injury biomechanics research over the past 30 years or so, we do know quite a bit about tolerance capability of humans. And whilst we can be thought of as being relatively sturdy overall, the speeds of many roads are higher than the human tolerance to impact constraints. In other words, harm in the form of death or serious injury is likely in the event that crashes occur. So a safe system really needs to tolerate errors and take, and take into account our physical limitations to prevent what we would describe as harm, but what could otherwise be translated as death or serious injury. How does this translate into real life situations? Well, here's a good example relating to pedestrian crashes. If you look at collision data, it tells us that pedestrian fatality rate is about 1% at an impact speed of 20 miles an hour, 7% at an impact speed of 30 miles an hour, and 31% at an impact speed of 40 miles per hour. So this is similar data taken from the UK on the spot study uh, involving 197 individual fatal pedestrian collisions. And it tells us around about 10% of pedestrian fatalities occur when the speed of impact is below 30 miles per hour. However, the risk increases rapidly, something like 4.5 times, once the impact speed increases from 30 to 40 miles per hour. So we have this basic step change in injury risk once the impact speed between the vehicle and the pedestrian increases from 30 to 40 miles per hour, and then again from 40 to 50 miles per hour. Tingvoll and Howarth, uh, using a combination of Australian and European data, actually believe that the chances of survival start to decrease rapidly above impact speeds of 20 miles per hour, which is slightly at odds with the UK data. But clearly, we do have this um, exponential relationship between the speed and risk of death for vulnerable road users, particularly pedestrians, such that once you have impact speeds of 40 miles per hour, the probability of death is around about 50%. And if you look at Tingvoll and Howard's study, it also shows that impact speed limitations for car, for car occupant fatalities is around about 30 miles per hour for side impacts, which is your typical uh, junction or intersection collision in an urban environment, and something like 45 miles per hour for head-on crashes, which is a typical crash uh, in an overtaken situation in a rural environment. And having this sort of data really helps us to determine and specify what safe system speeds should be. And you may have come across this type of data uh, in various media campaigns, uh, such as one launched by the, um, the Think campaign, which was quite a hard hitting campaign, suggesting that if you hit a child at 30 miles per hour, there's a 10% chance of killing the child, whereas at 40 miles per hour, the risk is 50%. And this is all based on real life data collected from crash investigations in the UK. And overall, it really is quite powerful stuff. So given the challenges of individual differences, including differences in road user type, age, gender, etc., it really represents a challenge to authorities and rule makers. In a typical urban or rural environment, there's a danger that the speed limit of the road can be set by the general road speed behavior of the road users in particular the vehicle users. But within a safe system, the key is to take into account the human tolerance to impact and ensure that the crash speeds 
and hence the subsequent crash forces cannot exceed specific tolerances. Obviously, this is an ideal scenario and it's not always practical, but it's one of the key principles that really underpins the safe system. So going back to the research literature and including the study of Tingwall and Howarth, a range of safe speeds are postulated for various conflict types. In other words, road speeds for different types of road infrastructure and traffic that will be survivable or safe in those particular environments. For example, for locations with significant possible conflicts between cars and pedestrians, the speed limit should be around about 20 miles per hour. Where roads exist with no possibility of side impact or head-on crashes, such as dual carriageways and A roads with median separation, you can probably raise the speed to over 60 miles per hour. And in between, you tend to cut your cloth accordingly. So hopefully a message is coming across about speed being a fairly fundamental consideration in the safe system approach. Small changes in speed can have a marked effect on the risk of death and injury. And many researchers have observed that above a certain value, a small increase in speed can lead to a large increase in the risk of fatality. But the converse is also true. So small decreases in speed can significantly decrease the risk of death and injury. So, for example, Nielsen's estimates are really quite impressive in this context because it's shown here with a general 10% uh, decrease in mean speed, you can have or achieve something like a 20% decrease in injury crashes and a 40% decrease in fatal crashes. But recent World Health Organization data is also quite revealing because it, because it claims that a five or just a 5% decrease in speed could lead to a 30% reduction in fatal uh, injuries. So in practice, what do we need to do regarding speed? And the safe system would really uh, suggest the following four principles. First of all, that vulnerable road users should not be exposed to motorized vehicles at speeds exceeding 20 miles per hour. Otherwise, either complete separation of the road user is needed or vehicle speed should be reduced to 30 kilometers per hour, particularly in high pedestrian concentration areas. Secondly, that car occupants should not be exposed to other motorized vehicles at speeds ex exceeding 30 miles per hour in 90 degree intersections, or otherwise there should be separation of the road user or the likely angle of, in of impact should be reduced. Thirdly, where there's potential for head-on impacts with vehicles of the same weight, the speeds should be reduced ideally to around about 40 miles per hour. If there is significant risk of impact with larger vehicles, such as trucks or buses, um, where you've got separation, the laws of physics suggest that the speed should be reduced to something like 30 miles per hour. And also roadside objects need to be considered. Where there's high potential for crashes with roadside objects, and no separation or guard railing is possible. Ideally, you should reduce the road speed to around about 40 miles an hour. When you've got roadside objects in question which are very hostile, such as poles and trees, and again, no separation of guard railing is possible, then ideally, your road speed should be reduced to 30 miles per hour. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Aaron Corey and I'm the Vehicle Purchasing Manager here at Reflex Vehicle Hire. As part of this webinar today, I'm going to explore as how a fleet provider we choose the safest vehicles. So just a short introduction to who we are and what we do. We're a flexible vehicle rental company providing passenger cars and light commercial vehicles at the three and a half ton. We've been around for just under 10 years, in which time we've grew a fleet size of just shy of 6,000 vehicles. Um, operating at our size, We've got a lot of people to consider in regards to safety. We've got our customers, our own employees and driver teams, and arguably just as importantly, every other road user in which we share the roads with. And therefore, road safety is one of the biggest focal points for us as a business. So exposure to instance increases the more time and distance spent traveling on the roads. So it's our duty to ensure that every single minute and mile is traveled as safely as possible. 
Here's some data from our fleet spanning a year period, which illustrates the average mileage is covered and time spent traveling. 7 million hours or 137 million miles every year. Just to put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of one vehicle driving flat out for 837 years or driving to the moon and back 111 times. We believe the decisions and choices we make in regards to our vehicle options and service allow us to, to dramatically reduce the number of incidents our vehicles and drivers are exposed to while starting down the roads. Obviously, operating and managing a fleet of our size comes with the responsibility of doing it safely. Let's move on to some of the choices we make in regards to safety of our vehicles and how we aim to mitigate incidents as much as possible. So there are obvious differences in the usage and applications of cars and commercial vehicles, but they're also treated very differently in terms of what's expected in terms of safety features. Commercial vehicles tend to be a lot more basic in terms of safety features, meaning the options must be specified in addition to the base vehicle. On the flip side, cars tend to come with many options as standard. In some instances, what is standard on a car can sometimes be up to a thousand pound optional extra for the equivalent safety feature on a commercial. So for our car fleet, we review the Euro NCAP ratings and information to determine our choices. In general, cars built today are undoubtedly the safest they have ever been. However, it's well worth reviewing the individual safety ratings for both occupants and other road users. Rather than just a standard car, we take every opportunity to buy our cars with additional safety enhancements, of which we'll go into more detail shortly. Some of the options we specify are even subject to Euro NCAP advanced rewards. Examples such as the Driver Assistance Pack and Safety Pack Plus, which features Lane Assist and Seat Leon, and the Crew Protection Assist featured in the Skoda Superb, as you can see on screen here. With our commercial vehicles, we take a fundamental step to speed limit every vehicle we purchase to 70 miles an hour. Of course, that's the maximum possible speed limit for a vehicle of this type. However, when you look at the stopping distances from 80 down to 70 miles an hour, is a significant increase of 23 meters, which is about a third. The speed limit that we fit as standard could be the difference between a collision happening and subsequent injury. In late 2019, we also made a decision to factory order and purchase all our commercials with passenger airbags as standard. Unlike cars, most commercial vehicles don't come with these as standard, but that doesn't mean that these vehicles don't carry passengers too. We believe that a passenger should be protected just as much as a driver in the event of a collision. We'll still look to specify additional safety equipment on our commercial vehicles where feasible, although not to the full extent in which we do with our car fleet. So going further than just the vehicle themselves, we provide a complete package that is centered around safety. FlexiCam is our branded camera and telemax device, which provides driving data and instant video notifications to fleet managers. FlexiNap is a fatigue monitoring device which recognizes tiredness or distractions within drivers. And finally, Driver Reflex is a mobile-based app which provides a platform for daily check reporting as well as SOS assistance, ensuring every journey started out is a safe one. So with the provision of our safe vehicles as well as our extra products, our duty of care package adopts an approach which is so much more than just handing over a set of keys to a driver and saying, away you go. So let's look a little more in depth into the safety features and technology that we incorporate into our vehicles. ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. You can pretty much guarantee that any new vehicle model put into production now will be equipped with some variant of collision warning or avoidance system as a minimum. Also known as Autonomous Emergency Braking, AEB, amongst other names, the vehicle will independently avoid collisions detected ahead without the intervention of the driver. For us, these are some of the most important and effective technologies in avoiding collisions. As road vehicles spend a majority of their time moving forward to higher speeds, these integrated features have the ability to mitigate, if not eradicate entirely, a huge scope of possible incidents. In the commercial aspect, the Mercedes Sprinter is a great example of where it's now a standard feature following its 2018 model change. Whereas there are some commercials where it's only a few hundred pounds to add this kind of technology. And so for us, it's a no brainer and we buy accordingly. It also may seem like an obvious one for most in production, but not all cars come with rear parking sensors as standard, especially the smaller ones. We will always look to add these from factory. 
Parking sensors are also an easily fitted aftermarket solution for commercials in which we can fit upon our customers' requests. In addition to a standard vehicle, we see every extra piece of safety technology as a potential instant avoided. So what technologies do we add to our vehicles to go above and beyond? A driver's peripheral vision can often get neglected. Blind spot warning systems effectively give drivers extra assistance in identifying hazards, which may easily escape vision. This system can be a massive help across a diverse spectrum of scenarios. For example, when changing lanes at high speed on a motorway, and there's another vehicle positioned where you right might not see it. Alternatively, you could be sat in gridlock in a city traffic and vulnerable road users such as cyclists are weaving in between slow moving, if not stationary vehicles. It's also common to find a rear cross traffic alert, RCTA device, where a blind spot warning system is installed as they use the same technology. These devices scan for hazard crossing the path of the rear of the vehicle whilst reversing, raising an alert if detected. They're especially effective when reversing out of limited view parking spaces or reversing around blind corners. Another useful safety feature when it comes to parking is a rear view camera, which for most fleet vehicles is an optional extra. Some vehicles even have a multiple camera system which provides a 360 degree or bird's eye view. With a combination of both parking sensors and a rear view camera, I think you're pretty well covered, but it's a great feature to have an entire view of your surroundings in one display. I like rear view parking sensors. We can also retrofit rear view cameras to our commercials, which is quite a common requirement with the large vans which are more awkward to park. We also fit white noise reversing alarms, which alert vulnerable road users to vehicles in which are reversing. Lane departure systems detect when a vehicle is leaving its current lane and raise an alarm on the dashboard. If the driver is an indicator upon departure, the system will alert the driver to correct their course back into the correct lane. Some advanced systems even auto-correct the steering back into the lane, and some require no hands on the wheel at all. According to NCAP, if every car was equipped with a lane assist system, it would equate to a potential saving of over 5,000 deaths and almost 40,000 serious injuries in the EU27. Statistics like these make me think that features like this will gradually become standard in every vehicle in coming years. Adaptive Cruise Control, ACC, adds a level of intelligence and autonomy to your standard cruise control. Using the same radar technologies, autonomous emergency braking systems, ACC will recognize the vehicle in front and adjust the driving vehicle's speed in order to maintain a consistent and safe distance between the two. It's great for long distance driving. You effectively get on the motorway, set the speed, and effectively next time you have to touch the pedals is when you get off. So the technologies that I've touched on all reduce the risk of human error piece by piece and remove the manual element of driving. Personally, I think each of these is a step towards totally autonomous driving. We've all seen futuristic illustrations of flying and self-driving cars, but the reality is that they're still a long way away from being commonplace. The closest we've probably got in the real world is Tesla's autopilot system, which does the majority of the driving for you. The vehicles of tomorrow are also likely to be connected and therefore could be subject to cyber attacks, which raises even more new question regarding road safety. And if you thought there was a lack of electric vehicle charging infrastructure now, then there's certainly decades to go before we can facilitate self-driving cars as a norm. But for now, as long as we continue our due diligence in procuring the safest vehicles, utilizing safe technologies, and above all, keeping safety at the forefront of our actions, I believe that we will keep people safe on the roads. Okay, so thank you for tuning in. Should you wish to get in touch, my contact details on screen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm happy to talk to you a little bit about safe systems from the safe road user perspective. Um, and we'll start by stating the absolute obvious, which is that um, when you look at uh, the reasons why uh, crashes take place, it's primarily due to human error. And uh, on the uh, graphic there, you'll see some of those main human factors aspects of uh, unsafe driving. So what Safe Systems is all about really is managing that human error and making sure that you can reduce the chances of those things 
taking place. So how can a fleet manager actually manage risk from a safe systems perspective? And that's what I'm going to be talking about just now. First of all, one of the go-to interventions that is often put in place for managing uh, road user behavior at work is skills-based driver training. And whilst that is a very good option for people who require an improvement in their skills where it's obvious that that is the problem. But if you want to improve your crash rates, then the focus of your fleet risk management program should be on behavior. Because as we've already said, it's the behavioral aspects of the human system that is most likely to be the result in, in terms of crashes. So how can fleet managers influence driver behavior as part of that safe systems approach? Well, from a behavioral safety perspective, the aim is to define what is actually safe and unsafe driver behavior. And that might sound fairly obvious, but it's often not because people can have different views about what is safe and what is not safe. Once you've made those decisions, and there is an evidence base around that, so uh, that's something to take on board, then you need to monitor those unsafe acts and then make some practical and realistic changes to influence the behavior. And you can do that via your policies and procedures. And what's important from a behavioral safety perspective is that once you see those behaviors improve, that you reinforce them so that there isn't a sort of a fault based analysis where there's a blame oriented approach, but actually something positive around the behavior changing is, is always a good thing to instill those new behaviors. And the benefits of this approach is that you get engagement from an employee, supervisor and management level and everybody's in it together, everybody's contributing to the safe operations at work. And of course, another benefit is that you have regular communications with your workforce where the language is all around safety and people are very well aware of what they need to do. And it's very constructive, especially when you use a coaching approach to actually work one-to-one -one or in, in workshops and group discussions with your people to find out what the problems are and try and find solutions to those problems. And you need to act very promptly when you identify those unsafe acts because inconsistency in how you deal with those problems is a lot of the problems when it comes to managing risk. If you are inconsistent, then often these things can develop and, and, and worsen. And of course, the benefit ultimately here is to reduce your crash rates, which is good from so many different perspectives. So behavioral safety approaches is, is one of the systems that you can implement. What are the indicators that you need a behavioral safety approach? Well, you might see widespread, almost routine procedural violations where people are just not doing what they're supposed to do. If that's the case, then you know that you need to start tackling the problem. Often that means that there's quite a high cost in terms of bent metal and absenteeism, uh, vehicles being off the road, uh, loss of uh, potential um, uh, sales and a whole heap of different problems that occur when you have these widespread routine procedural violations, not just in terms of the safety, but also in terms of operations. The question is, do you have adequate resources to manage the risk? Because in my experience, clearly there are some companies that would very much like to see their crash risk reducing, but unfortunately don't put enough resources into managing that. So that needs to be carefully considered before you start. Do you monitor unsafe behaviors? Sometimes um, companies are not really aware of what's going on and telematics has a good role to play here to actually monitor high speeds, for example. Do you administer a driver risk assessment? 
this is a way of measuring behavioural safety, especially if you use driver metrics. Do you put drivers under pressure for work? Do they have a high workload? Do you turn a blind eye to mobile phone use? Are there things that are going on in the workplace that you kind of don't acknowledge because you're mostly focusing on getting the job done? And in the end, this is counterproductive. Do your operations lead to driver fatigue? Are your drivers tired? Are they, have they got enough time to take a break? Um, and of course, are you implementing a fleet risk management program? This program needs to be carefully structured and targeted for your specific problems. And that needs to be put in place and then evaluated. So the next steps then to make your fleet safety program work for you and to make sure that you see the benefits of this system that you've put in place is to really make a strong commitment to safety as a priority and then you can lead by example. The, pe the people that have the responsibility for leading safety within the workplace really should be reporting those results to the board because having buy-in at senior level is known to be very important when it comes to seeing the results you want to see. Make sure you're identifying those in unsafe acts and when you have uh, decided on what it is that you want to measure from observing those unsafe acts, Make sure you benchmark them. This is important before you actually implement any fleet risk management program. Once you've identified the unsafe acts, then you can review the goals that you have and what you want to achieve so you can set your targets. Then you should audit your policies, especially those that have an impact on driver safety. So for example, do your travel policies make drivers want to return home before rather than having a break um, these are important considerations uh, how does your policy or or your various policies how do they um, create unsafe behaviors within your workforce and if there's anything there that you can identify then that should obviously be changed Make sure you communicate with your drivers regularly. You may have driver briefings. They don't need to be very long, um, but where the message is safety, perhaps if your workforce is uh, uh, all over the, the country, then you could have regular emails going out to ask them to be especially careful today, the weather is bad or whatever. And just so that they're constantly getting the message that safety is a priority. Provide support for behavioural change because if you're expecting drivers for example to not use their mobile phone once they're, once they're driving then you should allow time for them to pull over when it's safe and to have calls if that's necessary for the job. Ensure that drivers are fully compliant with your procedures um, allow for uh, first, uh, you know, a, a chance when they make a mistake. But you know, if there's a consistency in the violations, if there's more than one occurrence, then there needs to be a policy in place as to how to deal with that. So manage these violations consistently, and make sure you reward safe behaviour. You could mention it in your annual appraisals really good to see that you had a good safety record this year well done um, your target next year is to continue and not have any incidents this year and that can feel like it's part of their discussion with their managers and it's an important aspect of their job monitor any improvements that you are able to identify and then evaluate you know what's good about the program what needs to change how can you make sure that your workforce are constant, consistently and continuously improving over time? Thank you.
Good afternoon, my name is Damien Penny and we at Lytics are pleased to support BREAK and this Safe Systems webinar. Nothing is more important than finding ways to improve driver safety by utilising technology and embracing fleet safety best practice. We can reduce the risk of collisions and help keep the roads safe. And it's certainly important right now as many delivery vehicles are being asked to work extraordinary shifts, getting goods to sites and homes faster while they are worrying about what is happening at home or with their extended family. These additional distractions to drivers are causing increased safety risks. I'll bring briefly um, some information to you later about what's happening across the UK since COVID crisis began. Roads are getting busier, more technology is being introduced, additional distractions are appearing, so we need to ensure our drivers have the skills, support and technology they need to perform at their best 100% of the time. Although we're a technology company, we believe that the most important technology in the cab is the driver. And so we focus our solutions around them. Lytics delivers video telematics solutions that are looking to revolutionize the approach to safety in fleets. Through the use of machine vision and artificial intelligence, MVAI, we can identify risk where traditional telematic systems just can't. Through the use of predictive analytics, our solutions identify behavior that will lead to collisions in the future, a proactive approach to safety rather than a reactive approach to today's fleet systems. Finally, by having all the fleets connected to so have a access in near real time to a view of what the driver has seen or is seeing enables an agile and responsive approach to fleet safety and management. Intelligent video is seeing a significant uptake across fleets globally because many safety programs have results that have plateaued. And with insurance costs going up, companies are looking to approach the same problem of fleet safety and productivity, but in a new way. So there are three areas of video, video telematics, that are used to help companies and drivers today. The first is a reactive video solution. So an event has happened. The company needs to know exactly what, so they can begin the claims and recovery process and try and minimize their insurance costs. First notification of loss is the main reason for usage of this type of technology, as auto-related cost reduction is critical. Some understanding of the incident could lead to corrective action, but safety is not the prime reason. The second is a driver warning solution that uses video to enable the driver to take action in the moment, hopefully before the identified risky situation turns into something else. These can be driver aids like those stipulated for DBS, driver alerts when following too close, such as an ADAS system, drowsy driving situations, distracted driving in general. The responsibility lies with the driver to take action. The challenge with these systems is that they typically trigger when a driver already finds themselves in a tight situation. Yes, they are there to help if this occurs, which is positive, but they can't be used in isolation of other technology or systems because there are many cases of drivers tuning out or multiple noisy systems that create a lot of false positives. The third use of video and video telematics is to identify driver behaviors and patterns and look to change behavior before it translates into risk on the road. Video can be captured when an event occurs, perhaps on its own, is not a highly risky event, but if combined with other factors could lead to a collision. This is where the predictive analytics comes in. This is where through coaching, drivers can go back to the road, behavior adjusted, and it fulfills the objective of getting them home safely at night. This approach also looks to identify the good behaviors often missed by other solutions. Reward and recognition of great driving goes a long way to improve safety across a fleet. These uses of videos can be all delivered by Lytics, for example, but what happens when there is no G-force event, no traditional telematics trigger to react to? What happens then? So I was at a show recently where presenters were in the middle of the audience. It allowed me to walk around the outside of the room and I noticed that for 
any one presenter on average around 20 to 25 percent of the audience were on their mobile phones distracted in general or in fact asleep now i'm sure if i'd called anyone out um, at that time they would have said they were very engaged with the presentation when it was my turn to speak i relayed this message to the audience their first reaction was to put the phones down but the question i asked was how many of your drivers are like you on their phones yet believe they were engaged with what was going on around them i re i paused and then after no response i asked but how would you even know so I, I went on to paint a picture of a driver traveling down the road, steering perhaps with their knees, eating a sandwich or even on a mobile phone. Um, they were driving very smoothly and they were under the speed limit, but traditional telematic solutions would not even know about this. They would assume a great driving score perhaps. And that is why those systems on their own no longer enable you to continue your risk reduction journey. While many safety programs have hit a plateau, just adding a camera on top of telematics that relies either on a telematic system itself or a g-force event for triggers does not hit the problem either however utilizing machine vision and artificial intelligence mvai identifies risk where other systems can't they do this by using trained algorithms that identify behaviors and objects which is the machine vision part and analyze it if they are risky or not, which is the artificial intelligence part. If a risky behavior is identified, it can warn the driver to cease and or it can catch a video for future coaching sessions. It can also record for how long those types of behavior continue over a, a shift. Whether it's following too close, whether it's rolling through an intersection, whether it's using a mobile phone, whether it's not wearing a seat belt, um, whether it's uh, eating and drinking or smoking, MVAI can help identify risk you never knew about and help make your drivers safer. However, MVAI is only as good as the data that goes into it. So be careful when reviewing the market. Ask, for example, how many vehicles are using this type of technology over how many years and how many miles of data or machine vision objects are being captured daily. Just as an example, uh, Lytics captures a thousand near collisions every day. It sees a, a billion miles of data every 10 days. And you may say, well, so what? Well, it, it is only this volume of data being received and analyzed that can educate the machine vision algorithms effectively and ensure a high level of accuracy. So when, for example, you receive a text from the video solution onto your mobile phone at three o'clock in the morning, you know something has happened in your fleet. Okay, well, this level of data is important for a number of other analytical reasons. Being able to predict what may happen in your fleet based on activity previously proven to lead to a risky event is one way, but by also looking at trends across a larger set of data, we're able to pivot our coaching and training responses. So Lytics reviewed its user base recently um, over the last couple of months and identified that um, a number of risky events, the risky behaviors and overall risk scores was on a downward trend. And this would be expected because less vehicles on the road. However, in the last three weeks of lockdown, we've seen an uptick in risky behaviors, such as not wearing seat belts up 46%, handheld phone usage up 25%, and smoking up 24%, and other distractions up 21%, significant changes in behavior. Now, I think these all have a similar theme around them as well. They're all happening inside the cab rather than on the road. Either because the drivers are too busy to think about this or they're too complacent now because there's less traffic on the road. But these are conversations that are needed today with the drivers, reminding them of safe working practices and in some cases, reminding them of the law. So one quick reminder also um, for you is that consider the risk of when you're moving your fleets back onto the road. Lytics are working with many of our clients on how best to get the fleets back up to capacity once the lockdown has been lifted. And if you imagine there'll be new drivers coming on board, 
joining the company, existing drivers with the same bad habits, perhaps, and existing good drivers who may now be very enthusiastic to get going and perhaps have a heavier right foot. It's worth considering a plan and a relaunch to help bring the, your drivers back effectively. And we, of course, at Lytics will be happy to help you uh, in that initiative. So in summary, um, existing telematics solutions without video are limited in identifying risk. They can only tell you what has happened, not the why. Proactive versus reactive solutions have the fastest impact on risk reduction and on your bottom line. Proactive solutions coupled with other capability provide the best overall program. Machine vision and artificial intelligence should be introduced to your business as soon as possible. Only through this technology can you really see the true risk on the road. Um, beware of those noisy solutions I spoke about that don't have educated algorithms and make sure you select a vendor with substantial data engine behind them. And be mindful on the, uh, of the risk on the road today while still in lockdown and consider a strategy to introduce your drivers. Otherwise, you will be potentially reintroducing risk. So thank you for your time today. Um, I hope it's been useful and we look forward to being in contact with you very soon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Glenn Davis and uh, here uh, supporting uh, supporting break today with a webinar um, on uh, safe system, certainly went out on the roads. And uh, my uh, my job today is to cover off uh, collision investigation and the uh, the actions um, post crash. Um, you know, so uh, uh, we'll have done everything possible to prevent that crash from occurring. However, when um, you know we are involved in a crash, then there are certain uh, actions that we should take. So, firstly, what I'd like to say is that inanimate objects don't crash; people do. Um, you know, and, and quite often we we fail to look at the. Uh, um, the, the effects that people have on vehicles out on the roads um, in a post-crash situation. So I'm certainly going to be uh, covering that uh, during this short presentation. So we've had a crash, we've been involved in an incident. Um, that, uh, that, that image there that you see uh, was, a, was a crash that I saw early one morning uh, just outside Milton Keynes. Uh, when uh, when a van driver veered off the road and hit a tree. Uh, so if we are in that situation, there are a few actions that we have to consider and make sure that we conduct um, before we can return back to business as usual. First action, driver wellbeing, making sure that the driver um, is uh, is firstly okay um, and and also that their competence um, is, is assessed before they return back to driving duties. Um, you know, one thing that quite often we do see is drivers involved in a crash. Um, we may have a quick conversation with the driver and then we give them a set of keys for another vehicle and they're off on the roads again before we've actually checked out their well-being, checked out their health, checked out their eyesight um, and also their competency to be behind the wheel. Next step though, which we do take generally quite seriously, is that the vehicle is inspected and repaired before being returned to the road. So quite often we do this um, for the vehicle, we check the vehicle over, a professional checks the vehicle over uh, before the vehicle is returned to the road. However, quite often the driver isn't. As I said, people have accidents, not inanimate objects. Um, our next step, we need to collate the incident facts, get them uh, all together, make sure that they're accurate, uh, that they're recorded correctly. And there's a whole host of uh, means that we can, uh, we can get the facts uh, of the incident to start making decisions and understanding why the incident actually happened. We then need to conduct the investigation, determine the direct, the contributory, and the root causes, not just looking for that convenient cause to close down the case as quickly as possible. We want to get an understanding how this happened, why it happened, what was the last decision out on the road, but what was the first trigger decision as to why this incident happened? It may not have been actually on the road. We need to analyze the investigation outcome, 
determine the remedial actions. Um, you know, what are we going to do to uh, to 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 address the shortfall, whatever that shortfall may have been? Was it operational? Was it the driver? Was it the vehicle? Was it the conditions? Was it the routing? Um, whatever those uh, shortfalls were, uh, we need to put some kind of remedial actions in place, uh, and then we need to. Uh, make sure that those actions that we put in place prevent similar incidents from reoccurring. So a whole host of uh, steps to take in the event of an incident and a whole host of learnings that we can take forward. So does one size fit all? When we consider collision investigation, we consider the police at the scene, we think about the uh, the, the measuring of the, uh, the the skid marks and the tire tread, uh, the, uh, the, the forensics that go into understanding the vehicle and its speed and trajectory, etc. However, when we're doing this at organizational level, we need some simple methods. Um, you know, we need to make sure that there's not one size that fits all. You know, we're not going to conduct uh, police style forensics for every single incident. However, there are a number of uh, um, actions that we can take ourselves. So we need to make sure that the uh, actions that we take are proportionate. So if there's a serious injury, if there's a fatality, of course, that's where the police style forensics may come in. But if it's a slight injury, um, if it's uh, on behalf of uh, um, determining the, uh, the, the, um, the, the cause with regard to um, insurance and that type of thing, or even damage only, then we need to make sure that, that our findings or our actions are proportionate. So in establishing those facts, looking at the driver, the vehicle, the operation and the incident itself, uh, the driver, uh, we can look at training records, the training history, the license checks, um, you know, was the driver appropriately licensed to drive the vehicle? Is there an inf infringement record? Is there a track record um, of, uh, um, of infringements? Uh, is there a track record of collisions in the past, similar collisions even? Um, checking the medical, the eyesight, and also the declarations. Has that driver signed to say that they've read and understood the driver handbook, that they've read and understood the highway code, um, that they will report uh, to their line manager if they've got any medical eyesight or license issues? The vehicle itself, looking at the walk around checks, reported defects, inspection history, uh, the maintenance, the tire history, even the telematics data that comes from it. So there's a whole host of information that we can get from the vehicle, uh, including nowadays most vehicles with camera systems fitted. So a whole host of uh, facts that we can get from that. The operation, why was that vehicle out on the road? What was the journey? Was it on, on route? Um, you know, was, or was it off route for some reason? Any operational constraints? And then finally, the incident itself, are there any witness, witness statements? Is there any CCTV footage? Has a post-collision record been created? Are there photographs? A whole host of facts that can be established. The interview with the driver, though, is the cornerstone of any collision investigator. It is the driver's point of view. It is the ability to verify those facts. We can ask direct questions, even if we know the answer from CCTV footage or from some other mean, we can still ask the question of the, of, of the, uh, of the driver. We can get their version of the offence. We can determine um, the direct cause, the contributory causes and drill down to the root cause. Also at the end, we need to make a judgment and we need to make some kind of recommended remedial action. The interviewer, whoever conducts the investigative interview, uh, must be partial, must be detached from the incident in some way and have the ability to control their emotion. The skills that they need, effective communication, good questioning, um, knowledge of the traffic law, problem solving, critical thinking, competent writer, decision making, a whole host of skills. But I think what is quite key is making sure that it's not the line manager that conducts this interview, it's probably somebody from outside the line of control because the problem with this incident that occurred could have been through the line management. 
types of calls, as I said, not the convenient calls. We don't want to get to this cause as quickly as possible. We're looking for the direct cause. What was the last unsafe act, the unsafe condition just before the collision? What are the contributory causes? What are all of the other factors that may have contributed to the direct cause? What we call the Swiss cheese effect, all of the different um, conditions that, uh, that, that created uh, the direct cause or helped create the direct cause. And then the root cause, the one single thing that if that, thi if that did not happen today, then the accident wouldn't have happened. And that root cause might not have been on the road. It may have been at the office, it may have been a managerial decision, um, you know, so we need to understand that as well. The collision investigation, the inquisitive mind, um, we have here Rudyard Kipling. I keep six honest Serbian men, they taught me all I knew, their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. So we need to understand what happened, why it happened, when did it happen, how it happened, where did it happen and who was involved. Five of those are quite simply answered but the why did it happen is the tricky one that is the one where we need to get down to the crux identifying the root cause one of the key tools out there is the five why analysis why we continue asking why not necessarily five you might get to four you might get to six seven eight um you know but we keep asking why until there's no other answer so i crashed into the back of another vehicle why I didn't have time to react. Why? I misjudged the traffic situation. Why? I was distracted and in a hurry. Why? Well, I was late for the next drop. Why? And that final why could actually switch to another set of whys because I was given too many tasks that day. Now we're starting asking questions in the office. So the five why analysis. Also, finding out whether the act action or inaction was it a misguided decision was it an error was it a lapse or was it a violation was it somebody who just made a mistake was it somebody who had a loss of concentration didn't realize what they were doing or was it somebody who did something consciously the conscious unsafe act so the example here that we've got in the image the misguided decision i i you know was it an error i didn't know what that sign meant an error a loss of concentration, I didn't realize, I didn't see it, I turned right into that into that side road and I just didn't see the sign. Or a conscious unsafe act, which is actually, I saw the sign, I knew what it meant, I decided to disregard it. Three completely different outcomes from the same action. Finally, making those recommendations Going back to the management, the driver, the vehicle, the operations, we should be making recommendations that are appropriate to the collision. What actually uh, happened? What was the key failing? Was it managerial failing? What is it? Was it a problem with the vehicle? Was it something uh, wrong with the operation? Or was it purely the driver on the day? Um, so there's a whole host of uh, recommendations that we could uh, explore there. Ladies, gentlemen, very short presentation, but uh, it's been a pleasure. I'm Ben Glenn Davis. Thank you very much. That concludes the formal presentations for today's webinar. Thank you very much to our speakers for their contributions to this event. I'm pleased to say that we are joined now by Aaron, Damien, Glenn and Lisa, who shortly will be answering some of your questions that you've submitted today. But first, we'll have a quick look at the result of today's poll which asks which of the following elements of the safe systems approach to road safety does your organization currently use? As you can see, 63% of respondents said they're educating drivers about safe driving behaviors. 10% said they are using vehicles with active safety measures. 13% maintain vehicles to the highest safety standards and 13% investigate the causes of crashes involving their drivers or vehicles. However, 0% have said they plan journeys to avoid places where people regularly walk and cycle. Due to time constraints today, as we've already overrun, we will not have time to field every question that has been submitted. However, we will um, run through a couple of them now. I have a question here now for Aaron. Okay, Aaron, um, what would you say the most essential technologies 
the safe vehicles that fleet managers should be looking for when they're trying to purchase or procure new vehicles? Um, like I mentioned in the presentation, definitely um, if it's a car, I'll probably already have it, but if it's commercial, it's uh, quite a selective option. The collision avoidance system, which covers the front of the car, that is for us absolutely essential. And um, as you see in some of the videos with that Toyo Corolla, the car will break for itself. And um, I can speak from personal experience, although I'm not too proud of it. I have nudged someone in the back before at slow speeds. And if that technology had been present on a vehicle, then it simply wouldn't have happened. So that kind of stuff goes leaps and bounds for me. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, we also have a question for Lisa. Uh, Lisa, how can we be sure that the positive driver behaviours that are being taught during training sessions are being maintained over time, over the course of the next few months or so? Yes, good question. Well, obviously, if you've got the benefits of telematics system in, uh, systems in there, then you can keep uh, a close eye on whether or not people are compliant after training. Um, but there are other ways that you can evaluate as well. You could um, set up a sort of a, a, a survey type uh, response format where you're looking at people's self-reported compliance um, and then have some kind of um, spot checks. Uh, but really telematics is the answer for uh, making sure that the behaviours are compliant. Excellent, thank you. Um, speaking of telematics, Damien, what's the uh, main functionality of telematics for safer journey routing? So I assume um, planning journeys to avoid places where people work and live. Yeah, well, I mean, those, those systems are available. I mean, there's um, typically uh, there are routing systems that are put in place to look at the uh, the fastest and the, the quickest routes which which could avoid um, uh, built up urban areas so those systems are certainly available but there's also the ability to take um, information from the telematic systems to say where the, the riskiest areas are areas that perhaps are uh, lower speed areas which could be around by schools areas where there have been additional or, or multiple collisions or risky uh, driving events happening in the past, taking that historical data and putting it into these routing systems to allow them to then predict the, the best route going forward. So using the, the, the information you're picking up on a regular basis just keeps your uh, routing system up to speed. So you will be changing the, the routes of your drivers on, on a regular basis. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, and finally, just quickly, we have time for one final question uh, for Glenn today. Um, you spoke obviously at length about um, post-crash investigations and things, uh, but how can fleets best share the learnings from these kinds of investigations, I suppose, if they've got some best practice to share with other fleets? Do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, I think I think sharing best practice is quite tricky. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, collaboration and you know an admission of uh, areas where you may have gone wrong um, is is obviously quite uh, quite well protected. Um, but uh, I think I think the, be the best sort of way of, uh, of of sharing best practice is probably um, is probably out networking. It's probably out you know going out work workshops um, or even attending you know webinar sessions like like today uh, and and just getting out face to face and sharing best practice in that way i don't think there are uh, particularly sort of uh, you know frameworks or methods or anything like that you know where we can sort of you know post all of this information into um, you know one particular repository um, i think it's more about um, you know the, the good old fashioned way of uh, sharing best practice from uh, from one one organisation to another. Um, uh, case studies, though, are quite key. Um, you know, and it, but it, but it, again, developing a case study is one thing. It's what we actually do with it, how we market it, and how we get it out there. How do we get it out into you know the wider um, uh, the the wider community, uh, if you like. You know, so uh, good good marketing activity, I think, behind your case studies. Brilliant, thank you very much, Glenn. That concludes the live Q&A session of today's webinar. You should now be able to see on screen uh, a short
profile of our upcoming webinars, including our Spotlight on Driver Distraction that is running on May 21st. I would just like to have a huge thank you for today's speakers and of course to our sponsors, Litix, for supporting today's webinar. I hope you've all found it informative and engaging and you've been able to take home some useful information for working towards our shared goal of safe and healthy mobility in fleets. If you'd like to continue any of the conversations that have been had today's event, please join our Global Fleet Champions LinkedIn page where you can continue the conversation. Thank you very much. The webinar will now conclude.